Welcome to the Best Business Podcast, the podcast for established marketers, entrepreneurs, and CEOs. The ones who want to join me in my mission to create 200 new multimillionaires who solve world problems with entrepreneurship. If that's you, then this podcast was created to give you access to the tools, training, strategies, and tactics you need to achieve multiple seven-figure profits as soon as possible. This world needs the best business you can build. So please get ready, open your mind, believe you can do this, and let's build a better world together for future generations. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by online pay-per-click marketing expert and gangster, Ben Simkin. And now I don't say gangster because he's mean or vicious, not at all. I call him a gangster because when you hear the numbers and results he's getting clients, it's completely mind-boggling. To date, he's increased his clients' revenues by over $900 million. He runs a seven-figure agency in the land down under Australia, lives in a beautiful, beautiful home with a beautiful wife, and and if I remember correctly, I think they're on the ocean too. Um, he's wicked smart, but also talks like a kid you grew up with, your best friend next door. A mentor once told me there are four stages to business. The first stage is no money, just an idea and starting out. The second stage is you're making some money, but it's inconsistent with ups and downs. It's still a struggle. The third stage is you're making more than enough to live off of. Money worries shrink away and disappear almost entirely. And the fourth stage is you start investing and letting your money make money for you. Well, Ben is now entering the fourth stage I just talked about, and he's coaching others to level three using the agency model. He's a valued friend, a candid and trusted advisor. He's also someone I look up to in business, and I'm very excited to introduce you guys to him. Ben, thank you so, so much for coming here today to speak with us and share your wisdom. How you doing, brother? I'm doing really well, Daryl, and, and uh, that's a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course, of course. It's, yeah, it's the least I can do. So thank you for joining us the call. And, you know, I actually don't really know how, what you were doing before you even got into the agency model. Like, how did you wake up and decide to become a pay-per-click expert and start generating millions of dollars for people? Yeah, I mean, my story is, is quite, quite a large, diverse, crazy story. I guess I'll start from the very start. You know, I was... I wasn't even really a business-minded person or entrepreneur because I came from a pretty poor family. Um, nobody in my in my family or nobody I even knew at all, friends or family or anyone, was in business. So it was kind of like a foreign concept to me. And um, you know, really just real working class, not even not even middle class. So I come from that kind of background where there was complete ignorance about business. Um, but but when I was thirteen, my uh, my parents were able to, to rustle, up, rustle up some money and get me a secondhand computer. And um, I, 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 got onto that, I got onto that computer, started teaching myself how to do programming and writing software and video games and things like that. And that was really my, my start. Um, I feel like that was my seed or my origin of where I came from because when I was about 16, um, I, I, got a, uh, I got a phone call from a, f a family friend and he said, hey, I know you're good at computers. I've got this business, this entrepreneur, this business owner who's got this, you know, um, real estate company. And what had happened was his IT manager that worked for him had had a falling out. So what he did was lock the entire company down, the entire computer system. So the company basically ceased um, trading because they couldn't do any work. Whoa. And, um, and they said, can you help? And I said, yeah, I can. So I went in there and I... I basically hacked into the system and I restored access to everyone and, and, and got the company up and running within about, I think, a day or two. And um, and that, that business owner was obviously so grateful for me. He kind of took me under his wing and, and he said, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go and work for people. You shouldn't be an employee. You should actually go and um, run your own company. But that, you know, that was such a foreign concept to me. It took me about five or six years to really think about that. And then when I was 20 years old, or 21 rather, I, I said, you know what, let's do it. You know, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my own company. That was really where I started there, and that was an IT company, and um, that, that really grew from there. So um, that's really how I got started in, in the business. But how I got started into, um, into the online marketing stuff is, is really crazy as well because I was doing the IT stuff, and I had a client we were doing computer, you know, computer work for, Obviously, I had staff and everything else like that, but um, this client calls me because we were fixing his computers and stuff. 
And he said, oh, I want to get started into this online marketing stuff. I've heard how, how if you get a website, then you can, you know, you get more clients and things like this. Um, that was 2005. And I had no idea what, what marketing was. I didn't know what, what a landing page was, PPC, like you name it, whatever jargon term you want to throw at me, I didn't know what it was. But instead of saying no, I can't help you. I said, "Yeah, well, let's do it. Let's let's um let's let's um you know I'll do it for you." <laughs> right. So I was rustling around trying to figure out what to do. Um, I found somebody who could do a website for him, so I did that, and then um, I figured out somehow that you could rent an email list because I, I didn't know what you know I didn't know what a list broker was. Obviously, I figured out you could rent these lists of people, and I found well, I got the. He he ran this newspaper ad in the in the newspaper since 1980 and, and achieved some amazing results, like millions and millions of dollars for it. So all I did was I scanned this newspaper ad into, into the computer with this with a computer scanner, and I sent this ad out like verbatim to this email list of 10,000 people, and that's all I knew what to do. But from that, he made about um, three million dollars in the sales. Whoa. And that was when the light bulb came on in my in my head, and I was like, "Wow, there's some you know, there's something really big here." <laughs> yeah, send an email, make three million. I have to ask, what was he selling? I'm um, selling investments, so selling you know investment properties and, and other investments that he that he sold. Got it. <clears throat> Got it. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we did that, and then I was like, "Well, there's something in this," you know. Um, I should learn more about this stuff. So I went and bought like $3,000 worth of books just to figure out what, what was going on. And I think the very first book that I got my hands on, I think from memory, was a book by Jeffrey and Brian Eisenberg called Waiting for Your Cat to Bark. I mean, that was, for me, that was one of the, the real um, books that made a massive impact on on my career in marketing and really laid the foundations for for how I was going to proceed from that from that point onwards. What was it called? Then, um, how to get your cat to bark? <laughs> waiting for your cat to bark. It's such a crazy crazy um, book name, <laughs> but um, getting that book really really solidified where I was going to start, you know, start that journey and what direction I was going to take that, and that that was really one of the foundational pieces, I think. Got it. Got it. Got it. Sorry, I'm going to get that book because I don't know that book. That's a, that's a great title. So, all right. So, you, you you started a business. You, I guess, partnered with this guy. You decided to, you know, rent a list. You just very, very smartly, unbeknownst to you, just sent it verbatim, his control ad, I guess, to the list. He makes $3 million. You're like, hmm, there's something to this. And so, you start trying to figure out what happened. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you think about, well, I mean, from my point of view, in my IT business, I wasn't really making millions of dollars. I mean, I was, at that point, I was working 20 hours a day in the IT company, probably making around maybe 300 grand a year, taking home 300K. Um, and um, I mean, I was I was obviously around 25 years old. It was pretty good money. But for me, I mean, I've always had this thing where Ever since I've really had that seed in me that I wanted to start a company, I always wanted to be, I always wanted to reach the stars. You know, I always wanted to be like someone like you know, Rockefeller or J.P. Morgan or someone like that. So, making that kind of money at at the age of twenty five wasn't satisfying to me because I wanted to you know go further and further. But when I was like, this guy just made so much, so much money from something so simple, so sending an email out. I want to get in on this. And that was really what what kind of you know spearheaded me into the into the whole online marketing world and and figuring out how to do that. And I mean, since then we've been doing some you know working with some amazing clients and, and getting some stuff. And like you said before in the intro, now I'm doing it for my own company. So I'm investing, building my own company, so that I can have have that legacy. And I really want to create something that's going to outlive me. Um, and that's really where I'm at right now in my life. That's awesome. That's so awesome. So in your marketing career, I mean, you've obviously become very adept. You know, you started off with the book Waiting for Your Cat to Bark, but what, were there any, like, major milestones or challenges that you came across in growing your business? Can you see yourself, like, having gone through any phases or any big, like, oh, when I realized that and I started doing that, it really made a difference? Or is there anything like that that you can share with us about kind of how you, how you grew and progressed as a marketer and a business owner? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so many... There's so many, and I, I see, 
I have a different philosophy on business than most people might, and I I expect that things disasters will happen on a daily basis. I expect failures to happen. I expect you to lose money. I expect you to have something go wrong in your life on a daily basis. And when I wake up with that kind of thing, it's it's not. I don't think it's a negative mindset. It's kind of like a reality. So that when I wake up, I'm fully prepared for the day. Now, if something goes wrong, then I go, well, let's address that. Let's see how we can solve that problem or make that into an opportunity rather than kind of getting on the back foot going, oh, man, I'm going to cry about losing this client or I'm going to cry about, um, you know, something that's gone wrong. I'm fully prepared mentally to say, well, let's deal with that. I expect that to, ha- that to have happened. How do we make the best of that? And we, and we move forward and move forward. And I think it comes from, you know, when I was – in my IT company, you know, there was a point where I woke up one morning. I remember the day very clearly. I woke up one morning. I looked at my bank account in the company. I had eight staff, to, you know, eight mouths to feed um, on a monthly basis. I woke up one morning. I looked at my bank account and it said zero dollars. And I knew that I had three days to pay the, pay the wages. I knew that I had to pay the, the office rent, the, the phone bills, um, squillions of other yep. expenses. Yep. And I had no way to do it. I had no way to do it. On top of that, I had just completed a massive expansion in the company, which put me basically in debt to the tune of $350,000. Whoa. And, um, you know, I had, I think I had $120,000 in credit card bills. Um, I owed my landlord some ridiculous amount of money and I had no way to do it. And and that day I said, well, okay, well, that's it. You know, I, I don't have, I don't know what to do. I'm going to give up. I'm going to go bankrupt. That was that day. The next day, I go to sleep. The next day, I wake up and say, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to fight through this. I'm going to get through it. So from then on, I've, I worked so smart. I wrote down, I said, I said to myself, I'm going to write down 10 things that I can do to fix this problem. So I wrote these 10 things down. I went through the entire list. Only about three or four of those things paid off and really made it made a difference. But The difference was I was making massive focused action towards solving a specific problem. I had a sense of urgency and I had that drive to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to let this beat me. And within 18 months, well, well, actually within six months, I turned the company around from being, um, losing money to, to being profitable. And within 18 months, I was, I paid back every single dollar that I owed to the, to the tax man, to the, to the credit card guys, to anybody who I had money to, I paid every single dollar back within 18 months without getting loans or without doing anything like that. And from that point, I said to myself, if I can do that, if I can make that much money in that short amount of time, then I can do that for the rest of my life. And the biggest thing I think people lack is really the sense of urgency and also the focus. Because, I mean, if you think about the sense of urgency, if you had someone put a gun to your head and say, make 50 grand before the end of the week, you're going to pretty much figure out how to do it. But if you don't have something, you know, that, that monkey on your back or something to hold you accountable, then you're not going to, you're not going to do it. Your time frames are going to, you're going to push out. You're going to put things off. Nothing's ever going to happen. But in my case, if I didn't pay these bills, I was going to get shut down. So I was fighting, fighting, fighting. You know, I had people saying, if you don't pay this bill, $20,000 bill by the end of the week, they're going to shut you down. So I had every week these people calling me up saying, you got to do this, otherwise it's going to be the end of you. And then that pushed me to go further and further and, and, and really figure out how to grow a company, how to make large amounts of money. That's awesome. And then look, and then at the end, once you paid everyone off, you've built this beautiful little business asset for yourself that now that money gets to go into your pocket. So I love that because I think that's so true. I've seen it time and time again. Nothing fails like success. You know, even myself, like, you know, you, something happens, you have a windfall or whatever, and it's just really easy to, to relax, you know, to be like, hey, I earned to relax a little bit. And you do that, but then it's hard to get back into that, you know, it's hard to get your game face back on. So I love that. That's great. And you're, you're totally right. I mean, you found a way. Humans have done so many amazing things, but it was, it was at a necessity. Um, so how do you maintain that now? I mean, that worked for them, but what have you done since then? Because it's not like you did that and then, you know, and you've just kind of like rode that wave for the next nine years, you know, eight years. <laughs> I mean, that would be great. That's what we all dream, right? We all dream that we'll do that one thing. We'll, we'll sell that one business and just kick it on the beach for the rest of it. Like, just, I don't think that's a reality. But for you, how do you, how do you do that? How do you maintain focus and urgency? Yeah, I mean, definitely for make, maintaining those two things 
absolute laser focus and number two that that sense of urgency to you know if you don't get it done today then it's then it's going to be all over I wake up with those feelings because obviously I'm a lot I'm a lot better off now and I'm, I'm comfortable and I don't have to worry about money anymore but what I feel like is that that could be taken away and I, I don't want to go back to the pain that I felt all the all those years ago when I had zero dollars in the bank and I felt so defeated and I felt so stressed out I don't want to have to feel that ever again in my life and I work every day to fight that and say that I'm never going to be in that position ever again I love that. I love that. I've said forever. I don't. I usually quote other people, but one thing I do feel I want to take away for is I've always believed that you should never betray the behaviors that got you where you are, and that's that's so awesome. Um, that is so true. Yeah, yeah. that is that is one hundred percent spot on. Right, and that's and I saw I learned that from athletics, from training with a lot of world champions and gold and Olympic athletes and stuff, and and just you see people if they change what they're doing or they change their training partners or something like that, it would it would it would drop off. They would feel. I mean, you see it all the time. That's why people love someone who's like is a champ again and again and again and again. Right? We just had Mayweather. Right? Everyone wants wants to see him fail, but people love how he keeps winning. Right? Because um, it's just hard to stay on point that hard. I mean, a lot of people, especially the champions, like when you talk about that, you literally have to be obsessed. You, you, like when you say that, I don't, I don't think you're just saying that. Like when you say you wake up feeling that way, like I, I very much understand that you wake up feeling that way. I don't know if all the <laughs> listeners understand that, but you wake up with that. Like I've been there. Like you've got bills to pay. I had a tax issue once, and I was, I had money for months, and it was right, it was the end of November, and uh, yeah, I had money for months. Could have had a great Christmas, all this great stuff, and. Um, it's a little bit of a long story. It's been a long story, but I didn't pay my taxes due to some bad CPAs because I just I just launched this business, so they didn't even think I was going to make any money or owe anything. So they told me to focus on being successful first and worry about the taxes later. Well, that's not what the tax man thought. And I literally I remember it was like new, in the last day of November, and I went to pay some graphic designer I'd hired to help me with a some sort of product logo or something, and my, all my bank accounts were at zero. And the government had wow. emptied all my bank accounts, canceled my card, and anytime money went into that account, it just disappeared. And so I started – like when you said that, that's where I went back to was that, that moment where I was like, I've got like people to pay. I've got rent tomorrow. Like I, yeah. like, I know exactly that fire that hits you in the belly. And they're like – you still feel that sense of urgency, but you – I don't know if this is a dangerous question to ask, but do you, after having been through that, is it kind of less scary? Like you remember the pain and you never want to go back there, but does it make it less scary? And so you're less afraid of failure or, I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't think it makes it any, any less scary because I, I really feel that from the, from the inside, you know, really from the heart, I can still really feel how it was because I mean, I wasn't even able to make, you know, spend much money on groceries at that point in my life and it was just the, the rock bottom of my life and I, I can really I can still feel it because uh, because of you know the impact on my life yeah. so to say that it's kind of am I am I afraid of failing I know obviously I'm in a good position I know what to do I know how to grow companies but at the same time from the emotional point of view it still feels like I want to I want to get up every day and, and keep walking forward and keep running forward because I don't want to go backwards. Mm. That's really where it is. And and like you said, like in the sporting world, there's so many parallels in the sporting in the sporting arena and the sporting world that you can really take from. I mean, we we're, were watching a big uh, big rugby game here in Australia last night, which is one of the biggest games of the of, of the year. And my team won, which is which is good, yeah. but. We run. We won by such a big margin. It was it was fifty two to six. That is an enormous margin. Wow. And even in the very last part of the game, the last you know five ten minutes of the game, we our team could have just like relaxed, but they fought so hard just to get those extra few goals, even though they knew they were going to win. You know they were yeah. they were putting themselves on the line um, to to get those those extra extra tries and. You know, really, if you're in business, you have to keep pushing no matter what. You can't put take the pedal off. You can't take your foot off the pedal. I mean, you've got to keep going. And But at the same time, you've got to have the right direction, the right focus, because if you're just running running really fast in the wrong direction, it's going to make things a lot, hell of a lot worse. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. That's great advice. It's advice I want to write down and just... 
remind myself as well, but what do you think have been some of the habits that have led to your success? Like when you say you know how to grow a company and all these things, what are the key habits that you feel kind of have seen you through good times and bad times? Yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely one of my greatest things that I do, and I, I don't know where it came from. I think it just one of part of my 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 makeup in, in my in myself is to is to really observe a lot. I observe, and I have done throughout my entire career. I've observed successful people, but I've also observed um, unsuccessful people as well. And I observe everything that I do in my life, and I, I do what what. Is, is referred to as a post-mortem with if, if something goes wrong in my business with a staff member, with a sale, if I lose a sale, if something goes wrong, I, I, I sit down and I, and I look at it and, and I do what, you know, a post-mortem, I think about how could I have prevented that? How could I have made that work so that I know next time, am I saying the wrong thing? Am I approaching it the wrong way? And so that I keep building on that kind of library of experience and I look at Look at my, you know, I have clients who are multi, multi, multi millionaires. I have friends that are that are wealthy, and I know people that are unsuccessful, unsuccessful as well. And I emulate the habits of the successful people. I don't copy their business models, and I don't copy their marketing, and I don't copy their intellectual property. But I look at the habits that they do. You know, how do they work? How do they structure their time? What are they, you know, what are their philosophies on business and those kinds of things where I can I can take those on myself and I've seen taking on those those habits have really improved my success. That's awesome. So are there any key habits that jump out as like ones you must have? I, th- I think there are a lot of habits that, you know, how you approach work philosophically is really important. Um, and, 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 and little things like I've got a, I've got a client who's a multi, multi millionaire and I, and I looked at his business and, and I was like, well, how, how can I adopt those traits and why is he doing it? One of the things was he doesn't have a mobile phone. Um, and I was like, well, I want to get to the point where I don't have to have a mobile phone and I've, I've got a mobile phone, but nobody calls me. Hmm. So, um, that's one of the things that I've, I've really adopted and that, you know, that's, that's really liberating because if you think about it, if you have some people calling you all day, every day, how are you going to get any work done? And that's really, you know, there's a lot of little things like that, that really add up and really, you know, the success that you can get from those little things compound over time. If I have increased my productivity by three hours a day, then compound that over 10 years and I'm, I'm ahead of you. You can't even catch up to me anymore. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it really, it, it really is. And, and, and to draw another parallel between athletics and, um, and business, I'm do I, I'm an avid CrossFitter. Um, you know, I'm also a Gracie Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, MMA athlete. At least I was, I owned a gym, but I'm, I'm loving CrossFit now because when I moved around, I wasn't able to train. And one of the things that's funny, cause I went and joined this gym and I've, you know, I remember showing up and there's some guys that you can tell that they're kind of like the alpha dogs in the gym. And I don't really try to get like, I'm friendly, but I'm not there to make friends, so to speak. But it's funny because I remember walking in on the first day and I beat two of those guys' records and it was my first class at the gym. And (laughs) it's not like, it's not about being the best, but I remember, and it's funny because I've just been watching it as things kind of unfold. But when you mentioned the compound effect, that's something that like clued in. Like, I'm like, guys, like I'm, I've got like a couple of years on you. Like, do you know what I mean? Like I could sleep for a month and come up in here and still squash you because I like the compound effect. Like I've just got so much momentum going. If I, I mean, I'm at the gym five mornings a week right now, like, you know, at least. And so it's, it's like, how, how are you going to catch me with that? So I, I, that's a huge thing. I think the listeners need to think about, I mean, the good things you're doing in your life will stack up and the negative things that are holding you back will stack up. And it, it might not just be the decision that day. If you like to drink, if you like to smoke pot, or if you just like to watch a few hours of television, that really does compound over time. And like what you were just saying, I mean, it's what I think it was Einstein said, one of the major, what was it? Something about compound interest. One of the major wonders of the world is compound interest. Exactly. It is one of the most powerful concepts that, that most people don't really understand and i think if you if you don't know about it you should look up the rule of 72 or compound or compounding compound you know that that really affect you know something you just said reminded me about something about you know your habits and things like that you know there's there's a a, um i was listening to a charlie munger video the other day and he was saying about psychology you know a lot of people you know a lot of people say you know you you think what what you think about is, is who you are well, that is true, but what he was saying was what you do is de- defines who you are as well. You know, every time that you take on a bad habit, you know, 
you mentioned smoking pot or maybe eating bad food or whatever it is, every time you, you, you conduct in a bad habit, that defines who you are as a person. And, and that really stamps, it's like, you know, it really pounds into you every single day. Every time you do that, it pounds into you more and more mm-hmm. to the point where you can no longer change that. And you don't want to get into a point where um, where you, you find it so difficult to change a bad habit. You want to be on that bad habit. If you, if you, if you pick yourself up and say, hey, I'm eating too many bad foods or I'm smoking or I'm doing something that that's detrimental. Maybe I'm sleeping in too much and not working enough. Mm. If you have a bad habit and you can see it, you want to pick up on that straight away. You don't want to leave, leave that for, you know, six months, six years, six, you know, 20 years because that, that really defines you as a person and you, and you don't want it to do that. You want you want good habits to define you. I, I love that you brought that up. I love that because that is so powerful and so key. What I love the most about what you just said is that you don't want to leave it. You don't want to leave it and let it fester and forget about it and wait until it becomes a big problem. And if you're, if someone's listening to this and it is a big problem, then you're going to need help other than yourself to get out of it. And you're going to have to do the things that you don't want to do by being public and all that other stuff. But what I love about that is because it what you just said reminded me of, of – I love Jim Rohn. And he was he has a talk, a video or audio or whatever, where he talks about how you know you can't just be a positive thinker. Thinking positively is not going to get you there. And there's so many people that want to ignore negativity and only focus on the positive, but you can't do that. You know, He's like, if you've got a garden and weeds are starting to take it over, you can't – which is the bad habits that you were just mentioning – you can't just turn a blind eye to them. You can't just be like, whatever, the roses are beautiful, forget the weeds, I'm going to ignore the weeds. You have to kill the weeds. You have to be okay with killing weeds. You have to kill weeds and protect your garden. And that's... Yeah. Go, go. Isn't that going to creep up on you as well? Like, if you had... If you if you had a weed pop up every day and you just you just pull that weed out as as you saw it, versus just leaving it for six months and then dealing with it, how much more how much more difficult is it going to be to really you know fix that garden up after you've left it for six months? <laughs> yep, yep. Oh yeah, it's it's huge. It's huge. Those are those are great points, Ben. This is yeah. You're you're definitely giving some great value here. So I I love that. I love the copying this the habits of successful people watching. And I like the other part where you mentioned even just looking at unsuccessful people. You know, tell tell me, Joe, how did you mess up your life? Good looking guy like you, all the resources, good family. How did you screw it all up? Sit down and tell me your story, and I will take good notes. You know, like. Um, yeah, I mean, what was it? Like, unsuccessful people should give seminars, although no one would pay for them. But they'd be very valuable. There'd be a lot of good info in there, of what not to do. So Definitely. Think, <laughs> <laughs> so now let's get into some of your magic here because you are really good at growing companies. You are really good with creating scalable, consistent, predictable lead flow. Come on, man. Like, how? What? Like, who, who, who you bribing? What? Like, what's? Come on. What's some of the secret <laughs> stuff? I know, I know, I know. Some of the listeners are frothing at the mouth. So, like, nine hundred million in sales is not. You don't. That does. You don't sneeze and that happens. You have to know with precision what you're doing, and it's not by accident. So, lay, lay it on us. What, what's up? Definitely. I mean, there's some. I mean, this could talk. This we could talk about this for twenty four hours and not and not cover everything. But I've just got to pick something out of the out of the air and, and talk about it. Because it's such an in-depth thing, and and really, you've got to think about, you know, how do you, how do you do such mu- large amounts of money? And if you think about it from my point of view, um, I've I've got to either get paid on performance, or I or it's one of my own companies. So I want to make I want to maximize the my time. I don't want to spend an hour taking a company from fifty thousand to sixty thousand. I want to take a company from a million dollars to ten million dollars. That's really where my my focus should be. So, I mean, one of the things is obviously scalability. Um, scalability is, is critical. The, the average the average small business can't really grow to $10 million because there's no, there's no real infrastructure. There's no real way for you to, you can't, you can't really get there very easily. There's a lot of hurdles that you have to go through that you're completely unaware of. I know, I know the hurdles, the hurdles from taking a company from 50, 50 grand to a hundred grand. I know the hurdles from from a hundred grand to five hundred thousand dollars, and and so on and so forth up to the hundreds of millions of dollars. The hurdles and things that you've got to do are so completely different. Like what you're doing now, the habits that you're doing now, you can't just times it by a thousand and make a billion dollars because that's not how it works. So you've you've got to play a different game, and and you've got to play the right game. That's really one of the critical factors. Hmm. Um, so definitely playing the right game is one is one of the ways to do it. Just just repeating what you're doing now, 
um, to get to get to hundred million dollars is not going to work. Um, another point is, um, you know, really it comes down to um, with the marketing side of things, the lead generation side of things. It's really all about thinking about your target market. A lot of people talk about that, but it's really that's really the, one of the critical things to be able to. Um, do and to get a success is to be able to completely understand your tiger market intimately to the point where you know them better than they know themselves you know them better than you know your best friend you know your best friend's favorite movies you know what he loves you know what he hates you know what color she loves um you know she you know everything about your best friend but you need to know more about your target market than you do about you know your best mate or your best friend and um, that's really one of the critical factors in, in determining success. Got it. So how do you do that? How? how all right. I be, like. I'm sold. I believe you. I need to learn about my target market. <laughs> what? Like. What? Like. Can we point someone? I'm. I'm sure there's people on the call that they're just like, yeah, Daryl. Thank you for asking that. Just because is. I mean, like you said, this is this is easily a couple of days. We could be here talking for hours and hours. But someone here who's like, all right, look, all right, Ben, I'm in business. I'm doing good, making good money. I've got six figures or so. I think I know my customers. I've been doing this for X number of years. I mean, how do you really get to know your customers that intimately? What would you recommend? What are like the top three things you would recommend they do? Yeah, I mean, from a philosophical point of view, I think you always want to approach anything. I think anything in life and business, you want to approach it from a philosophical point of view, not a not a not a strategic or a tactical point of view. Philosophically, how do I approach this? You know, how what's my mindset when I approach this particular problem or situation in life? And, and when it comes to knowing your target market, you got to think about it from this point of view. What if you had to write a really really personal letter, handwritten letter, to your target market, who is one person, not not a group of people, one person to really convince them that your product or service is going to change their life, is going to save them from impending doom, that it's going to improve their life and legacy, not only for themselves but for their family and, and their generations to come. How do you write that letter so impactful so that they take action? And that's really what you have to do. That's really what copywriting is all about or marketing and advertising is really to get them to take an action because... The, the default state for humankind is is zero action, is to sit on that couch and eat Cheetos and do nothing but flick the remote control. Right. I mean, sitting down channel surfing is the default state of, of humankind. How do you get them to get off the couch and, and, and take action? And that really is one of the questions you have to ask yourself. And to do that, you have to know how to re- really pull at the, the heartstrings of your target market. So from a philosophical point of view, that is how you approach advertising. And then if you want to know, well, how do I know my target market? I think empathy plays a big role. Being able to really step inside the shoes of your target market. Can you do? Can you develop the ability to step, you know, if you're a devout, devout Christian, can you, can you develop the ability to step in the shoes authentically of an atheist, for example? That is really the ninja skill that you need to have. So well said. And I'm glad you brought up copywriting because it took me for a while to figure out. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know where on the scale of copywriters I am. I'm probably nowhere near the top, but I, I think I can hold my own in some circles. And I, I've, I studied it for the longest time and I never really quite got why it was so touted. Like why, why copywriting? Why does it matter so much? But you really expressed it there. I love what you talked about, which reminds me of another activity, an activity one of my other mentors, Tyler Garns, uh, first showed to me. He calls it the power of one. And that's an activity where, like what you said, if you just sit down and write one letter to one person and convince them to write on how your business is going to improve their life and all the good it's going to do for them and why they shouldn't do it. That really personal thing. And not just to mention like the, the things that – like to bring it home, to not just list, make a list, but to make it real for them. Right to make it jump out of the page. To talk about you know, hey, you know how your your you know your ex left you because you weren't able to be a provider, blah, blah, like whatever that is, right? <laughs> but like that you want to you want to be able to hit them home. Like you have to break through 
all that noise and really hit them in their emotional cords. And I never really got the value of that. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's one of the most powerful things about copywriting. And it's not even the skill of like everyone on this call, you might not have to be your company's copywriter, but you need to understand it and be able to judge and grade good copy and understand when something's in sync or in tune or not. Absolutely. Unless you have a massive budget and you can just throw a whole bunch of stuff out there and just spend a lot of money and wait to see what falls off and learn through trial and error, which you're going to do some of anyways. But I, th- I think that's great. That's a, that's a wonderful tip. Um, that's a good point, Daryl. I mean, we, we get campaigns where we spend millions and millions of dollars on, on advertising, but we don't we don't just flick it out there and see what happens and hope and pray that it works. Because after that $1 million is spent and we have no results, it's all over. So we, we actually spend so much time thinking about our target market. And we spend... You know, if if you would if you were to say, I'll give you five hours to put together a marketing campaign, I would spend four hours on the target market and one hour just putting the marketing together. Okay. So that's the kind of focus that you want to put on it. And you know, one of the things you kind of triggered off just now, just talking about you know, about talking or writing that letter to your target market, you got to also think about and and realize what kind of an impact your product or service has on your target market. You know, if you generate leads for somebody or if you're a copywriter or if you're a personal trainer, whatever it is, you're really in the business of really transforming someone's life and not only their life but everyone around them. If you think about, you know, a personal trainer, if you can if you can help people become healthier, live longer, become more agile, become more able-bodied, to be able to achieve more things in life, to be around a lot longer, to be there and present for their children and their wife or their or their husband, that has a tremendous impact not only on on that on that client's life but everyone around them as well. And anything that you do in life, you know, lead generation or copywriting, you're growing a company, you're increasing profits, you're empl- employing more staff, you're providing for not only the client's family, their extended family. Their, their generations to come, the employees' family, the, the impact that you have in somebody's life is so enormous that you probably haven't even sat down to think about how enormous that is. And if you really think about that, then you can communicate that to your target market as well and say, hey, you really have to do this because this is going to have a tremendous impact on, on your life and, and, and for years to come. I love your empathetic perspective from the customer's point of view. I think that's missing in so many circles and businesses because I've always had the philosophy, and I got this from Gary Bensavenga, that a problem is a market. It's not a demographic. It's not, you know, it's not a, it's not a psychographic. It's a problem that you're solving. And something that you mentioned earlier about small businesses not being able to, to scale, which is a real thing, that's almost a downfall. That's a huge shortcoming in businesses because if your business solves a problem, you know, I love the, the, the example of a dentist office. I always call like your business is a black box right and the black box is like a dentist office is an easy example because people come in crying and sad on one end they leave happy and smiling pain free <laughs> on the other end right and it's just a magical black box they go into where they get fixed up and if you actually solve that problem for people then you owe it to the world if you really because when we're kids and teenagers and that we always want to grow up and make a difference and we want you know like we want like we're so political and you know we just want to go out and ch- make changes in the world and be and be a uh, 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 be an influencer but then let somewhere along the way we forget about that and we lose that and i love what you're saying about the impact you're having on lives because if you have a business even if you're just feeding people at lunch like you're like you're providing hopefully nutritious like meals to people <laughs> right like before it's just feeding them right your, your goal was i'm just feeding people so they can work and happy and not you know and and make their lives li- and give them liberate their time so they can spend more time with their family so they can raise healthier kids all this sort of stuff right and so if your business is this black box that solves that problem problem you owe it to the world and to yourself to take your black box and put everyone through it that would benefit you know everyone that you can through it and so a a really good tool for anyone that's listening uh, that I've picked up along the way is the rule of 10,000 and so what Ben's talking about if you want to make sure that you're not in a business that's dead end flat that you can't scale think about how like could you handle 10,000 leads how would you handle 10,000 new customers how would you handle 10,000 complaints and the idea to think about is that like if you're baking a pie and you're just baking a pie for you and three friends, you think about it like almost for, like you said, Ben, philosophically from one point of view, oh, it's a pie, it just needs a few ingredients. But if you're baking, all of a sudden baking pies for 10 people, for 100 people, 
for a thousand people, suddenly you start thinking in different structural and strategic ways based on the philosophy that you're approaching pie making. And I think that that's really important. Anyone listening to this, if you want to grow a very large business, uh, depending on whatever stage you're at, if you're new, you might not even believe people will give you money. If you're getting paid but not consistent, you know it's out there. You just got to tap into that vein and it'll happen. You just got to keep hammering away at it. And if you're already up and running and you're just frustrated because you don't know how to scale, then that might be your problem. You might not be able to handle a larger capacity and that could be your bottleneck, whether you're lacking training and, and, and staff and resources or you're just not and like your company is lobster. You have too many people on fulfillment, not enough people in marketing or uh, vice versa. So that's a great Mm -hmm. thing that you brought up. And I just wanted to emphasize that because I don't want it to be lost on anyone listening to this when you talked about how most businesses don't even grow. Because when you said that, Ben, you kind of just gave away a huge clue that most people are already shot in the foot right out the gate. Yeah, you know, definitely. Like, I've I've met people like that too. I've I've been that person. I've I know people like they want to make thirty thousand dollars a month, but you know they're cutting hair. You know, yeah, and it's like definitely. You got to do the math. You know, you got to yeah. think about it. So, I think I think that's that's such an insightful point, and and I you know I've got another philosophy around approaching that, and and you know really really triggered some thoughts here for me, just talking about that because that is such an important point. And and I think that a lot of a lot of business owners kind of get into the business. They they say it's for the money, but at the end of the day, I think it's just because they want to have their name on the door. I think that's the wrong the wrong approach. You know, thinking from a point of view, if you, you know, I always think about this. You know, imagine there was these two women, right, who wanted to open up a clothing store, right? Mm-hmm. They go and get each. They each get a three hundred thousand. They, they don't know each other. They're, they're going to be competitors, so they each go and get a three hundred thousand dollar loan. To um to get a to get a lease to get a building to get all the stock to get to the marketing and to do everything else and they're side by side in this shopping center in this mall, right? And they're really fine to, to make some money. But what why why don't they collaborate? You know, imagine if they they met each other and, and said, let's pull our resources together and we can run this ourselves. How much better, bigger? You know, one person could have spent three hundred grand on stock, and the other one could have spent three hundred grand on on marketing to get a, a flood of customers in the door. Mm-hmm. How much more money are they, they going to make by collaborating? But a lot of people just want to be a lone wolf in business, mm-hmm. and that's really detrimental, I think, because you want, always want to see how can I collaborate, not not how can I make those pies myself and make as many as I can and keep all the money to myself. What if I went into partnership with with a bakery or or, or a pie shop, and I said, well, you know, I can I can collaborate with you. Let's go 50-50 or let's go 25, you know, let's go 60-40, whatever. I'll focus on, on getting more customers in the door. You focus on making the pies or vice versa and, and figuring out how you can collaborate on a much larger scale because I would rather have a smaller piece of a larger pie mm. than having the entire pie to myself. Mm, mm, mm. So well said. I Yeah, no, I, I love it. I love it. And something that came to mind too when you're talking about that, just from personal experience too, I remember – I remember when I was first getting started in business, I'm on the phone with a mentor paying an obscene amount of money a month to talk to because the guy could, you know, he generates millions of years. I'm not generating anything, right? So (laughs) so, uh, whatever money I make, I'll give to you to help me learn more. And I remember once it was an issue about hiring staff and and I, and like you mentioned just collaborating with other competitors that I had that maybe weren't cuz I was a G, I was a brick and mortar so maybe they weren't locally a competitor but I remember I was like but I don't want them to steal my idea I remember I had that <laughs> it was like in my head like they were going to take it and go get rich even though I wasn't getting rich off of it and I remember my mentor was like and and who's going to do what and he you know he's like Daryl even if they did take your ice everyone is so preoccupied with their own lives and their own story and their own mission the likelihood someone's going to take your idea and go and beat you with it is like slim to none and even then like we mentioned before about the compound effect I mean that's uh, Ray Kroc uh, the only way to sec- oh, I'm going to bastardize the quote but it's like the only guarantee the only way to uh, something about you have to lead in business with marketing and innovation and if you aren't leading by those, then you're falling behind. It was something like that. But basically, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, trademarks and patents and all that stuff. Like that's great. The lawyers can all take all your money to fight that battle if you mm-hmm. want. But for the most part, your main competitive advantage is just going to be to outwork and be faster than everyone. And I love how you mentioned the collaboration part because I think you're right. I think most people go into business for themselves, you know, uh, depending on what's going on, and then they're thinking about me, 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 me. 
you know, instead of about the other person. And the other part is that so many people are slaves to their job. And when you mention the two women thinking about doing it together and serving the customer first, suddenly there's not that pressure for you to do all be all. And there's like, I, when you said it that way, I almost felt like a freedom because I'm, you know, I'm a control freak, entrepreneur, whatever, right? But I felt like a freedom when you marketed it that, or when you talked about it that way. Because I'm thinking about a project I'm working on with four other guys who want to put on an event and do some stuff that way. And it's funny because it's a group thing and it's about the customer. I don't mind not being the star and I don't mind sharing stuff. But then I have other projects that I work on where I feel like I do want to own it. But it's I'm, when you said that, I realized it's because that project's really for me. Mm, and right yeah, when you said definitely. that, I was like, oh, I bet you I already know which one's going to be way more successful. You know, yeah. so yeah. I, I I don't know about you, but I, I would rather have millions of dollars in the bank and, and nobody know who I am versus everybody knowing I, who I am and being broke. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. No kidding. No kidding, right? So what, work hard in silence, let the, uh, let, uh, let the results speak for themselves. Something like that. Oh, I'm doing bad yep. with the quotes today, but um, <laughs> so that's that's huge. So you shared with us some of your background, some of the learning lessons you've had, um, some of the great, great tools that you've used to make smart decisions in your business and to make sure that you're constantly growing and working towards an ever increasing pie. So I really, really love that. What have been, do you think, what do you think has been one of the hardest lessons for you to learn in business just in general? Oh, that is a tough one. I mean, I, I feel like I'm learning lessons every day of my life. Um, and just from, from things that go wrong, really, I, I kind of welcome things that go wrong because it's like, well, how can I improve that? Mm. To have one specific big kind of thing to say, oh, you put him on the spot here. <laughs> That's okay. Don't, yeah, no worries. For me right now, the theme I think is just, it's like, it's the laser focus. It's the laser focus for me. Um, that's been one thing because I think, especially at least as an entrepreneur, it's so easy to get like the shiny bell syndrome or, you know, Hey, look what that one's doing. I should do something like that. Like you really just need to be laser focused and see things through. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, that's, that's really good because you know, I have this funny, this funny trick, right? Uh, you might laugh, but I always, I can always tell how successful somebody is by how many things they're doing. If somebody's on the, you know, on Facebook, you know, this week they're a, they're a life coach. Next week they're they're a heart centered um, consultant. The next the week after that they're an infusion soft consultant. The next week after that they're a, they're a marketer. I know how successful you are and how much money you're making by how many things you're doing. And if you're only doing one or two things at the very most, I know you're doing very very well because the only way to get success is to be laser focused. To think of it like, you know, think of your eyes as a, as a laser. And really, if you if you focus that laser in one small section, like on on the table or on a piece of paper, it's gonna it's gonna burn a hole in it. But if you if you're spreading that over the whole entire room, there's not nothing's gonna really happen. So you really want to laser focus on that. And it really comes back down to you know the theory of constraints. We have we all have constraints. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday saying you you know you you really only have probably say four hours of productivity time a day. You know, you might work for eight hours, but there's probably only four hours of stuff that you're not being interrupted, you're not getting a bit lethargic, you're not, you know, getting distracted. And if you only have four hours a day and you've got four companies that you're trying to launch or four different services you're providing, you know, oh, yeah, I do Infusionsoft, but I also do Photoshop and blah, blah, blah. How, how much of that time are you going to focus on building one of those into a mass, massive empire or an enterprise? Mm. And if you're spreading it all out, if you're only doing 10%, or say 25% of four different things, you're never going to finish that. You're never going to get to the goal because you're, you keep trying to get to the goal, but you're only putting a little bit into each single thing. And so you really want to just cut it down and say, I'm only going to do one or two things at the extreme most and do it well and do it really well because that's really what, what the key to success is. You know, it's like my, my success test. If I'm watching you and you're doing five things, hey, I know you're struggling. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> Even well, though you're telling me you're a seven-figure owner, right. I kind of know. I know, I know better. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. I, no, I love that. I love because it's it's so true. I mean, laser focus is a focus. Follow one course until successful, and it's one of the hardest things to do. But I think it's mm -hmm. one of the most important. And I loved your con your analogy of uh, like just your eyesight, your focus, because you you really can't handle more in a day. And I think part of what gets people is other people not sharing your vision. I had a great quote from another guest, and he said he's making t-shirts with 
quotes and stuff on them because he's sick of wearing <laughs> other people's logos and that. So it's a side, it's a side business he's doing, I guess, for to clothe him and his friends and family. Um, but one of them I love is, uh, and I don't know what your religion or anyone's religion is, but it's fine. I believe there's a God, but we all have different paths, blah, 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 blah. But his thing was, don't expect other people to understand your grind when God didn't give them your vision. And I think that's really important for people to think about when, you know, when other people try to be naysayers or you work too much or any of that stuff, you really have to live your life authentically to you. I'm, I. You there, bud? Hey. Oh, geez. Oh. <laughs> hey, what's up, Ben? How you doing? <laughs> I don't know what happened there. <laughs> uh, I had myself on mute, so I don't even know what the last thing. Oh. You're talking about focus. I went off on a tangent about focus. You're talking about the grind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's. I, I must have just hit my my uh, mute button. So sorry. That's okay. You can edit that out, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. We can edit it or might keep it. It depends. But it doesn't matter either way. The quote, though, I don't know if I said it or didn't say it, but it was don't was it don't expect other people to understand your grind when God didn't give them your vision. And I think that that's really important because I think a lot of people get detracted or, or swayed away from their their authentic selves because other people, you know, can't handle it. You know, like it's like, it's, again, it's like if I were at the gym and some new guy walks in, he'd think I was insane. And if I was to go by his standards, I would have his results. And so I think that that which you like the focus thing is huge. You really just the focus and the ability to just have a goal and see it through and keep working. You, when you were from a young age, wanted to achieve a high level of success. You put yourself in a scenario where you were over your head and you fought your way through it. And that gave you urgency and it gave you reasons why. And it gave, it was that gun to the head that you needed. And you, you know, and you stood up every day and you stood up to the challenge and you grew and you grew and you grew as a result of it. And you focused on scalable, sustainable things that could get you where you want to go. And you modeled success. You watched unsuccessful people and you tried to make sure that you were on the right side of the line and you've surrounded yourself with phenomenal people. And I think that that all stands as a really good testament for why you've had the results you've had. And I think for everyone listening to this call, they need to do that for themselves. We're, none of us are perfect. And I, I think it's all, it's a movie target it's an art and a science um but i think we all need to you know, look at ourselves every day and just wake up every morning and just try to improve ourselves you know like every day i mean that's why what, what i do at the gym i just go and i all right i'm working on this today and that compound effect can really take really take over and that's what i've gotten the most from you ben in this call is those those keys right there and i think that's been really 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 valuable yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, that's definitely um, you summed it up. I've never thought about it the way that you just summed it all up. It's quite quite profound. <laughs> look, at, look, at, you're going to be walking around with your chest puffed out all day, be like, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, I, I want to be respectful for your time because I know you're a busy man with lots going on. Um, I mean, I've got stuff to do too, but I'm I'm going to be going to a barbecue in a second. But what are you working on now? What are you really excited about? What would you like to share with the listeners about kind of where we should keep our eyes on you for where you're going to be in six months, eight months? And if anyone wants to get in touch, how do they reach out? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, the, we spoke about it before. The, big, the biggest thing that I'm really working on is building that legacy and, and investing in companies that are going to outlive me and, and, and really build up that wealth that way, not to have things that, that kind of rely on me. And then when I'm, when I'm not here, it's, it's all gone. So that's one of the biggest things I'm doing, investing in different different enterprises and, and, and that kind of stuff. But I mean, in terms of, you know, how you can reach reach out to me, obviously I'm on Facebook, um, Ben Simkin. You can jump on my website, which I'm sure um, you'll put up there or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I do mentoring um, for, for the right people. If you, if you have any interest in doing any mentoring, you can obviously reach out to me uh, and see if that's a fit or not. Um, I don't do that to make a, you know, I don't do that full time. Because I'm obviously most of my time is dedicated to actually doing this stuff rather than just teaching it. So, 
definitely. Um, but but if you want any help, obviously reach out to me and we can see what we can do. Mm. Yeah, and I can I can attest, I can vouch for Ben. He's like I said in the beginning of the call, he's very approachable, very easy as you can hear, easy to talk to guy. Um, obviously, he's got schedules to keep and things to do, but very respectful. And as long as you you come proper, you act right, he will uh, obviously reciprocate in return. And the so it's Ben Simkin, B E N S I M K I N. That's N uh, B I wait S I M is in money, K I N is in night. Um, and the website is <laughs> businessnet.com.au. I, we will put a link up, but for some of the people, if they just subscribe to iTunes or whatever, it's businessnet.com.au. And that's how you can get in touch with Ben and get some more information. Please, by all means, I'm introducing you to these people so you can take advantage of them. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Take advantage of knowing them and really try to add. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I got to be careful. That wasn't a Freudian slip or anything, but just take advantage of being introduced <laughs> to people like this. This whole podcast was spurred on because I just had a client that I was working with and we did over $2 million with a single campaign. And I went for coffee with an old friend. He said, Daryl, if I knew the people you knew and could have the conversations you have with them and listen to that stuff and fill my brain with that, I would be doing multi-million dollar campaigns for my clients too. And that's part of why I put this podcast on. And that's what I mean. Take advantage of this. If you're inspired, write it down. If you know you need to fix something, commit to fixing it. Commit in the next 24 hours. Not only are you going to write a list of 10 things you can do to solve the problem, but you're going to contact three people who can hold you accountable and and just and do it and make it happen. And like I said, reach out to Ben if you can. Um, and if it's something that interests you, Ben, what's the perfect kind of client kind of client for you to work with? Um, anybody who is, um, is, um, positive, um, has a good attitude and fun to work with and, you know, accepts that they don't know everything. I mean, obviously I don't know everything as well, but you've got to, one of the biggest things that I've seen when I've mentored a couple of people could be, I don't do it a lot because, because of this is because some people don't want to hear and don't they're too too far they're too far down the rabbit hole of their own concept and own paradigms that they can't see anything else out and if they're doing something wrong they can't see it you know one of my one of my probably my all-time favorite quote that i i kind of quote all the time is is, is one by professor goldratt if you if you know professor goldratt he's like one of the most um smartest genius business owners of of all time. Um, I love this quote. If you are like nearly everyone else in this world, you have accepted so many things without question that you're not thinking at all. You know, most people are on autopilot and they think, oh, I'm not, I'm having this particular problem because of X, Y, and Z. But I, I go in there and, and I go into a company and I'm turning the, turning the company around or I'm investing in a company that's not doing well and I'm improving it. And they think the problem is over here, but in, in actual fact, the problem is all the way over there on the other side and a completely different issue. And when we solve that that problem, everything else just, it's kind of like a bottleneck. Right. Everything else just flows out. You know, the water just, just the, the money flows in then because they they haven't worked on the right problem. And that's really, I think, one of the biggest um, valuable pieces of getting a mentor because I obviously have my mentors as well, is to be able to get the perception from somebody else who's achieved what you want to achieve because they can see it, they, if they're if they're the eagle and you're and you're still walking on the ground, they can see it from a completely different perspective. And you want to go to the eagle. You don't want to go to the other guy who's walking around with you, you know, around the park. You want to go to somebody who can see everything around you, 360 degree view, and be able to give you the insight that you need to get to the next level. And I think if if you're open to that, then you can't not succeed. And that's really probably one of the biggest life lessons I think. Is to be is to be open to new possibilities. That's a huge tip because I don't think anyone anywhere can show us a, an Olympic gold medalist or world champion in any sport that got there without help. We all had a coach show us how to tie our shoes, have someone help us ride a bike, all that stuff. So I think mentorship is totally very, very, very much undervalued and unappreciated, and I'm really glad that you brought that up. So can you say that quote again? And it was Professor Goldratt, G-O-L-D-R-A-T-T. Is that correct? That's right, Professor Eli Goldratt. Eli, yeah. Uh, I didn't know who he was, but I, I Googled him, and I'm going to get to know him very well very soon. Yeah, he's got a lot of amazing books. The quote is, if you are like nearly everyone else in this world, you have accepted so many things without question that you're not thinking at all. I love that. I love that. 
Well, so everyone listening to this call, this is your time to think. You know, you know the drill. After every call, you need to write down the things that inspire you, things that you can do, things you can delegate, things you're going to get done. So thank you all for listening. Ben, thank you so much for your time. Um, I very much value and appreciate you as a friend, as a mentor, and as a, as a, as a, as a I guess as, a, as an industry associate, as a peer. Um, and just thank you for coming here and dropping these massive bombs of, of wisdom and gems and real, real stuff from the trenches. Like this is the part, like I know people listening and I know whoever's listening to this, you might be like in your car or in your shower or it, wherever you listen to this stuff, you know, and you may feel so far attached, but I mean, we've all been there, whatever level you're at, we've all been there and we've worked through it. Some of us have fallen back down and then, you know, come back <laughs> up, you know, but we're all there. So just because Ben and I are talking, you know, like there's nothing, for, I mean, Ben's offering mentorship. I do mentorship, but we're not trying to push anything on you. It really is just about helping people get forward. And so if, if you think it would help contact Ben, but by all means, like all the stuff in this call, it's real. There's no magic room. I'm, I can't say this enough on these calls. There's no secret room that Ben will actually, take people into be like all right guys here's the real magic like we've just <laughs> laid it out here for you okay and the rest of it just is what is it, it it's uh success is one percent inspiration and 99 percent perspiration so please listen to this a couple of times if you need to because there's some really good stuff in this call take the notes you need please take action and uh and ben just thank you so much for joining us today and i really value and appreciate the time you've given us Thank you, Daryl. I've really, uh, I've really enjoyed it. It's been, it's been really good. You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. Uh, you're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast, and if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself, and remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.